The story of Pixar doesn't start with its founding, a tech company's story rarely does. Rather, the original spark often comes from a university lab, a renegade group at a large company, or a hobbyist building stuff for fun. Pixar's story doesn't even start with the creation of Lucasfilm's Computer Graphics Group, which developed the Pixar Image Computer, the company's first product. The story, instead, goes back to a time when I and other researchers in computer graphics scattered around the United States began to see the technology as allowing a new art form, the creation of digitally animated movies. A handful of us began talking about when somebody would make the first one in the movie, we called it, and the massive computing power it would take to pull it off. That kind of computing power was not affordable in the mid-1970s, but with Moore's law cranking along at a steady pace, there was every reason to think that the cost of computing power would come down sufficiently within a decade or so. In the meantime, we focused on developing the software that would make the movie possible. This vision began to solidify at the New York Institute of Technology, starting about 1975. NYIT's owner, Alexander Schur, hired Ed Catmull, Malcolm Blanchard, and Alvy Ray Smith, adding David DeFrancesco soon after. DeFrancesco and Ray had been using and developing software that manipulated Pixel's painting pictures at Xerox Park. We formed the core of a group that grew to more than a dozen over four years. This NYIT group eventually produced a 22-minute short using the computer-assisted cell animation technology which they developed, but not until 1979. And it was still a long way from the movie, not only was it short, but it still involved a lot of hand drawing. In 1980, the four original members of the NYIT team had been hired by Lucasfilm to form its computer division. This division was charged with computerizing editing, sound design and mixing, special effects, and accounting for the company's books. At Lucasfilm, they continued to develop the software needed for three-dimensional computer-generated movies. And they worked on specialized hardware as well, designing a computer, called the Pixar Image Computer, that could run its calculations four times as fast as comparable general-purpose systems, but only for pixels. The four didn't get one of their fully computer-generated movie sequences into a major motion picture until 1982, with one-minute Genesis sequence in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. But then their computer graphics group, now numbering 40 people, got the news that the computer division was on the chopping block. George and Marsha Lucas divorced in 1983. Because California is a community property state, George effectively lost half his fortune overnight. Over the next couple of years this resulted in the computer divisions being split into distinct units that could be sold off, all except the game's project, which would become LucasArts. By 1985, the four were the last ones left. Ray walked into Ed Catmull's office near his and announced, we're going to be fired, Eddie George has never really understood who we are, and he can no longer afford us. It would be a sin to let this world-class group disperse. Let's start a company to give them a home. This was two computer nerds talking to each other. Neither of them had more than a middle manager's sense of budgets and resources, nor any detailed notion about raising money. So they bought two books each on how to start companies. What will the company do? Ed asked reasonably. They both knew that the computer graphics group couldn't become a separate company that depended on movies, not yet, or more importantly, that it would be difficult to capitalize their company on the prospect. And their calculations convinced them that neither a software company nor a digital effects and commercials house would produce revenues enough to support our group of 40 people. It had to be hardware. Ed and Ray did have a prototype special purpose computer, the Pixar Image Computer. So they wrote up a business plan to build and sell Pixar Image Computers, calling them supercomputers for pixels within their company. But first, they had to sell the idea of starting a company to the 38 other members of the Lucasfilm Computer Graphics Group. They described the plan, emphasizing that each employee would own a piece of the new company, regardless of job description. Then Ed Catmull and Ray began the grind of finding funds for the new company. Their first idea was to approach VCs. Apparently, they didn't fit their idea of a seed capital startup and they all turned them down, 35 of them. Then they turned their minds to making a strategic partnership with a large corporation instead. Of the 10 they talked to seriously, 8 turned them down. But we almost closed a joint deal with two vast corporations, General Motors and Philips. GMP and Philips had been our last hope. Ed and Ray were frantic. In the airport limo on our return trip to California, they came up with a Hail Mary, go to Steve Jobs. Now that the GM Phillips deal had fallen through, Ed and Ray decided to call Steve and ask him to make an offer. Lucasfilm did go for it, and Steve Jobs became the venture capitalist who financed Pixar. Steve took 70% and the employees had 30%.
Steve capitalized the company with $10 million. Pixar the company was officially born on February 3, 1986, and the full team thought they had an exciting product in the Pixar image computer. The Pixar team kept the possibility of the movie alive during the next five years with a series of short films like Luxo Jr. and Tin Toy. These short films are the sparkling jewels that sustained Pixar during these otherwise tough years. Pixar's sixth and crowning jewel during the pre-movie years was RenderMan, a groundbreaking piece of software that became an industry standard. RenderMan, published in 1990, has become a Hollywood staple for visual effects and animation. But Pixar, at that point, was still a hardware company. The Pixar team failed several times over the first five years. That failure measured the usual way, they ran out of money and couldn't pay the bills or the employees. The movie was not Steve Jobs' idea, he never talked about movies. He was a hardware man. The movie have been a dream and goal since the 1970s. During the next four years, Pixar completed the movie Toy Story and it premiered in 1995. Toy Story was wildly successful. Pixar at the time had little cash except what it had from selling off bits and pieces of the failing hardware part of the company and a few other small deals. Yet Jobs took Pixar public on November 29, 1995, on nothing more than the promise of Toy Story. It salvaged his reputation and made him a billionaire. Pixar's public offering set the company's value at $151.8 million at an opening price of $22, the stock closed that first day at $39. It was the biggest IPO of the year. Disney bought the company in 2006 for more than $7 billion. This is astounding considering they could have had them for free in the 1970s when they approached them on bended knee. Or they could have had them for $10 million in the mid-1980s when Jobs was our last chance.